All right, well, good morning, everyone. Slowly, I, I am starting to accrue more of your names into my memory as time goes along. You know, reportedly, the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon knew all 6,000 members of his congregation by name. So there are certainly some lofty examples to aspire to. Uh, but I do appreciate your patience as I get settled in here and continue getting to know you all. And so far, it has been a joy. You know, it's really amazing just seeing all the songs and the prayers and the scripture we, need. we did this morning. Every song or a verse that was read, I'm like, I said to my wife, like, that ties in so perfectly with the message I'm going to bring. And she's like, it's almost like God orchestrated the service, huh? <laughs> so it's great. I'm looking forward to bringing the word to you. And this morning, we are focusing our service around communion, which is, of course, something that we do regularly as a church. We take the bread and the cup, and as we eat and drink, we remember what Christ did for us on the cross. Now, communion, in a way, can almost seem like an oxymoron, because in effect, it is a somber celebration. Usually, we can only do one or the other. Either an event is somber or it's celebratory. For example, a child's birthday party is anything but somber, and if it becomes somber, it's because something went horribly wrong. Similarly, we aren't going to cheer when someone loses a loved one. But when we come to communion, a time when we reflect on the death of Christ, it calls for both a somber attitude and a celebratory joy on our part. We must be somber in considering the high price that Christ paid, but celebratory because of what he actually accomplished in his death, knowing also that because of his resurrection, communion is not just a memorial to a martyr who will never return. Jesus' death is unique from all others in history because his death gives humanity an undying hope. His sacrifice is greater than all other sacrifices that people have made in history because his sacrifice secures a transformation that will not pass away. And Jesus' blood is better, more precious than any other blood in the world because his blood was not only the life of his body, but his blood is the life of all who believe in him. So to focus our minds on what we remember in communion today, I would ask that you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Now, I won't go into as much detail in this chapter as I would if I was walking through Hebrews verse by verse, but this chapter of Hebrews really highlights the superiority of Christ's blood and also the benefits of the new covenant, which of course Christ instituted at the Last Supper. It is fitting then, as we partake in communion, to reflect on how Christ's blood changes our relationship to God. So then let's begin reading in Hebrews 9 at verse 1. The text says, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all 
was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. It was symbolic for the present time, in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, being concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Well, when we come to this point in the letter of Hebrews, the author is continuing to flesh out a contrast that he has already made between the old and the new covenant. Covenants, of course, are, are not things frequently made in our culture, at least not under that name. But essentially, a covenant was an oath that bound two people or two groups together, usually with one side offering benefits and protection, with the other side pledging allegiance and service. The central covenant operating before Christ, we know, was instituted with Moses. And in that covenant, God had promised to be the God of Israel, to give them land and blessing and victory over their enemies. But all this was under the stipulation that they would be obedient to his commands, which included having priests serve in God's house according to the guidelines which God laid out. So this house in which the priests served, it was called the tabernacle, otherwise known as the tent of meeting. Now, tents aren't exactly the epitome of prestige. We don't tend to house our most valuable possess possessions in walls of fabric. And yet, as we read here, this tent of the tabernacle contain contained some of the most precious objects imaginable. The first room contained the lampstand, the table, and the showbread. These are things that were consecrated to God, and therefore only those set apart as priests could tend to these objects, and only they could eat the showbread. And so while the courtyard outside this tent was open to the people, this first room was for the priests. This room was considered holy, and with holiness came restricted access. Now, I'm not sure many of us have a good grasp on exactly what holiness is and how crucial it is to the worship of God. Holiness, it means to be set apart, and it has this idea of absolute purity so that nothing impure is permitted to come near. Now, thinking of our communion service, it may be worth asking, with communion, do we consider it holy? Or perhaps even more importantly, we should ask, does God consider it holy? Well, the answer must be yes. Otherwise, he wouldn't have struck the Corinthians with sickness and death for abusing it, as we read about in 1 Corinthians 11. Even so, we're not afraid to take the bread and the cup ourselves. How is it that we can partake in such a holy event, all of us, and not only a select group? Well, if we are to truly understand the magnitude of this privilege that we now have, we must see the severity of God's holiness in this tabernacle. You know, typically when we see a do not touch sign, it's for the purpose of preserving that object or relic. But the tabernacle was restricted from the people so that they would be preserved. Because for an unclean, unconsecrated, sinful man to touch what God had sanctified would mean certain death. This was true even of the first room of the tabernacle. But as the text tells us, there was another room, even more sacred, than this first one. So the next room, divided from the first by a curtain, it housed the Ark of the Covenant, and this room was called the holiest of all. This is the room in which the pillar of smoke that represented God's presence would rest. And so here, only once a year, the high priest alone was permitted to enter. So now we see that the access has become even more restricted 
it's down to only one man. And even he had to come with an offering of blood. He was not permitted to appear before God empty-handed. And Hebrews tells us the message, the point of all these things, and the point is this, that the way into the holiest of all, the way into God's presence was not made manifest while this tabernacle was standing. Our God is holy. He is morally perfect, and he is a consuming fire. Therefore, his holy fire consumes the unclean and the sinful like grass. No Israelite could enter his presence and expect to live. Under the old covenant, if any of us were to approach God's presence and partake of holy things, we would be reduced to ashes. But in that the text tells us that the way into the holiest of all was not yet manifest while the first tabernacle was standing, we see that the way has now come to be opened. There is a way into God's very presence now. But understand, it is not because God has ceased being holy. He is holy forever. But those of us under the new covenant have a new relationship with God because of the blood by which we come. With the blood of animals, the high priest alone could approach God once a year. But with the blood of Christ Jesus, we have access eternally into the place of God's dwelling. By the sacrifice of Jesus, he has made us together a priesthood to God so that we may now take part in that which is holy. While the old sacrifices we read could not make one perfect, the sacrifice of Jesus does this for us. Therefore, it is not that unholy people may now freely approach God. Rather, the blood of Jesus makes us holy and consecrates us to God so that we may now come to him. So when we take the bread, remember how Christ said that this was his body broken for you. Consider his flogging in which whips tore his back, tore his flesh and exposed his bones. It is because his flesh was torn, that the veil separating you from God was torn. It was when his spirit was sundered from his body that the temple curtain was sundered in two from top to bottom. It is with his blood that we may now come to God. Christ's blood is better, and it is better because it allows us entrance into God's holy presence. Well, let's continue reading Hebrews 9, going now to verse 11. We read this. But Christ, so here's the contrast. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So the first part of Hebrews 9 that we looked at, it focused on the inadequacy of the first covenant, which could not make people perfect with regard to the conscience. It was focused on external realities, including foods, drinks, and fleshly ordinances. But that inward part of a person, 
his conscience, and his heart. The rituals of the first covenant could not touch. And so this next part of Hebrews 9, it specifies how Christ did what the first covenant could not. He came as high priest, to be sure, but not of the same kind as those former priests, nor did he enter the same house as those former priests, nor did he bring the same kind of offerings that those priests did. Instead, we read that the tabernacle which Christ entered was the greater and more perfect one, not made with human hands. And as verse 24 of Hebrews 9 will confirm, this means that Christ entered into heaven itself. So see, the, under, the tabernacle set up by Moses, it became a place on which God's presence would rest. But Christ went to the place of God's eternal residence, to the true most holy place in which the God who dwells in unapproachable light abides. So Christ then has made a way to not just let us behind an earthly curtain in order to see this ark and this pillar of smoke, but rather he has made a way for us to enter the true place of God's presence, of which the earthly tabernacle was only a copy and a symbol. And this again he has made possible by the offering of his own blood, the Old Covenant, we know, called for the blood of animals. And their blood indeed had a purpose, as the text tells us that it, it sanctified for the purifying of the flesh. In other words, the blood of goats and calves was useful for purifying a person outwardly. According to the law of Moses, unclean persons were to be put outside of the camp, and they could not participate in religious activities such as Passover. The blood of calves and goats made them clean, and it allowed them back into the camp and enabled them to participate in various rites and festivals. But the blood of these animals could not cleanse people's consciences or hearts. You know, when I wash dishes, it's true that I want the outside of my cup clean. I don't want to grab a glass and have it feel grubby. But I'm definitely not going to drink out of a glass that is dirty on the inside. Similarly, the law was useful in cleansing people outwardly, but without a clean heart, without a clean conscience, the way into God's presence would remain barred. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And according to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Apart from the blood of Christ, the things in your heart will only earn you an eternity in hell. But this is the great thing of the new covenant which Christ brought in. See, when Jesus lifted the cup and said, take and drink, this is my blood of the new covenant, there is a specific Old Testament prophecy that he is referring to. And it goes back to Jeremiah 31. The author of Hebrews has already made this connection in chapter 8, but it is useful to highlight a specific element of this new covenant because it indicates how our consciences are made clean through the blood of Christ. And so God says in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 34, that under the new covenant, he will forgive the iniquity of his people and their sins he will remember no more. It is because of the blood of Jesus that God chooses to no longer remember our sin. Not that he literally forgets, for as God, that would be impossible, but he chooses to no longer reckon sins to our account. And why? Because the blood of Christ has washed these sins away, and God will not dishonor the blood of his Son by recalling the sins which he paid for. Therefore, as Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Christ's blood is better, and it is better because it attains clean consciences for God's servants. What's going on in Hebrews 9 then? Let's uh, continue reading at verse 16. It says, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Christ had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Well, I admit it's possible that all this talk about blood and cleansing may sound strange to you. Although many of us are used to talking about the blood of Jesus, it's possible that for some it's become a mindless phrase that they say without really knowing what they're talking about. Or for others, blood is a dirty and a violent word, and they may wish that it was not part of our Christian vocabulary at all. Well, this paragraph of Hebrews 9, it tells us why the blood is so important and why it cannot be severed from our faith. So we've talked a lot about covenant today, and another word for covenant is testament, which is what the author of Hebrews uses here. And he makes the point that a testament is only put into effect after the testator dies. And we're somewhat familiar with this kind of idea, because when we write a will, we know that our possessions are only distributed according to that will after we die. It is likewise true that if this new covenant is to be instituted for us, if we are to receive the promised inheritance, then the one who institutes the covenant, namely Jesus, must die first. And so blood is part of both covenants. Both the old and the new covenants had to be dedicated with blood. And blood is required, again, because of the holiness of God, which we discussed earlier. The God who is a consuming fire will consume all sin. But with sacrifices, there's a transference that happens. God saw fit for the people to lay their sins on the sacrifice so that it would be consumed rather than them. And this is what happened at the cross. Our sins were laid on Christ so that he was consumed rather than us. What we need to understand then is that Jesus instituting this new covenant did not get rid of the law's requirement. Instead, whereas humanity could not fulfill the covenant obligations under Moses. Jesus does fulfill them. What Jesus does is he fulfills the law's requirement, not only by being obedient himself, but also by offering his own blood as the sacrifice for the sins of his people. He becomes the sacrifice required by the law. But also, because his blood was far superior to those former sacrifices, his blood gives us true forgiveness. You know, the text tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, meaning there is no forgiveness apart from this. Now, there are many who say that this idea that Christ was punished in our place, that he was substituted as the sacrifice for us, They'll say that that's reprehensible. 
But you must understand that if this teaching is not true, you have no forgiveness. And the scriptural testimony to this reality is abundant. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 says of Christ that he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. This is what the blood of Christ means for us. Christ's blood is better. And it is better because it atones truly for our transgressions. Finally, let's look at the last part of Hebrews 9. Start picking it up at verse 23. We read, Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Well, this, this section re-emphasizes some truths that we have already seen, but its focus is on the finality of Christ's sacrifice. The author of Hebrews reminds us that the high priest under the Old Covenant would offer the sacrifice for himself and for the people on an annual basis. Year after year he would go in, and this itself shows the inadequacy of those former sacrifices. As long as sin continued, more sacrifices would be required. But this is not true of Christ. He suffered once, and he has not done so since. How can that be when we do continue to sin even today? It is because Christ's blood was shed for more than a year's worth of sins. God, being omniscient, knows perfectly well all the sins we would ever commit, whether past, present, or future. And God took each one of those sins, whether past, present, or future, and he laid them on Christ. It is, in fact, because God knows perfectly well what all your sins are, that he can now choose to remember them no more, since he has placed every last one of them on Christ. Christ's sacrifice has paid once for all, for all your sins. Let us be clear then, when we come to communion, we are not reenacting Jesus' sacrifice. We are not representing the body and blood of Jesus to God, since only Jesus himself could make that offering. We come to the communion table to remember the once for all sacrifice of our Lord. And that once for all sacrifice is sufficient to put away all our sins. So also for this reason, we do not believe in purgatory. God has ordained it that man shall die once and then face the judgment. And so if Christ's blood has been applied to you through the Holy Spirit, then be assured that at death, you will go to be with the Lord in his presence instantly. Praise God. Moreover, the blood of Christ gives us the assurance that when Christ returns, it will be for our salvation. 
His second appearance will be to deliver us from the constraints of death and to remove the very presence of sin whose power he broke at the cross. This is why communion is a proclamation of joy for us and why we herald Christ's death until he comes. Christ's blood doesn't leave any debt on our part unpaid. Christ's blood is better, and it is better because it accomplishes the full price of our redemption. So I hope that these few truths we've looked at from Hebrews 9 help you understand both the gravity and the greatness of what we remember in communion. Let me offer you just a few ways in which these truths should continue to impact you beyond the communion service. First, don't hide yourself from God. The sacrifice of Christ has made the way for you to enter into God's presence. We don't need to hide ourselves from God like Adam and Eve did. Though we sin, and though we experience shame for that sin, we must not let those things drive us away from God. Your sin and your shame are what Christ came to bear in his own body so that you could come to him. Repent of your sin, yes, but you needn't drive yourself away from God. Christ's blood covers you now. Secondly, don't let your conscience be burdened with past sins. Your sin has been paid for by Jesus and paid in full. God considers Christ's blood sufficient to cover your sin, and you ought to see Christ's blood as sufficient as well. Remember also the words of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20, which says that if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. Christ's blood is better. It is greater than anything you have done. His blood cleanses your conscience to serve God in freedom and joy. Let it be so. Thirdly, dwell on the cost which Christ paid. Do not let the sight of the crucified Jesus be a passing thought to you, but consider well and deeply what he suffered in order to bring you to God. We do this in communion, but let the blood of Jesus consume your thoughts throughout the week. To meditate on Christ's sacrifice will drive you to deeper love and service for God. But if you forget what Christ has done on the cross, you will fall into despair. Therefore, let the blood of Christ captivate your attention more than anything else, and let it be your anchor. Finally, declare Christ's death for what it is, the perfectly sufficient sacrifice that covers all our sins because Christ died as our substitute. His death is not merely an inspiring example, so don't declare it like that. His death is not only a partial payment for sins, so don't declare that people must do more in order to earn God's favor. Declare the truth, though the world hates it, that Christ died for our sins in our place, and all who believe, no matter how vile, will receive full and complete forgiveness from Jesus. This is what we remember in communion. So may your hearts be strengthened through the good words of the Lord today. Let's pray. Father God, what a magnificent thing we call into our memories as we eat this bread and take this cup, Lord, something that you have called us to do in remembrance of you. Lord, we are, without words, we are overwhelmed by the vastness of the grace and love you displayed for us, that though we were unworthy, unclean sinners, you yet sent your Son 
to live the perfect life for us and to die the perfect death for us. And Lord, what else can we do but give thanks to you? There is nothing left for us to do to earn your grace. You give it to us freely, to us who believe in your Son, he who is the perfect spotless Lamb of God, truly God and truly man, who underwent such great suffering for us, Lord. It's, I can hardly bring myself to, even now just to uh, speak to you, Lord, but you have given me and all those here great grace. You have invited us to approach your throne with great boldness because of what our high priest did for us. We thank you for that, Lord, and ask that you continue to draw us to yourself. Give us peace and confidence to come to you and to live for you now as we go out into this world and proclaim the truth of the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, the gospel you have given us to proclaim. Help us now, Lord.